Hey, what's happening, everybody? Peter Olinto with you. Uh, let's see. My got my good buddy Sam Gottlieb, who runs the show here for the U World CFA program. Sam, why don't you say hello to the group? Good evening, everyone. Uh, so happy that you're able to take some time off from your evening, and uh, I think you're going to get some great wisdom here from Mr. Olinto tonight in the next few hours. Um, so I really don't have anything else. Uh, of, of note to add. So, Pete, I'm going to let you have at it. All right. And um, Sam, can you monitor? Is there a chat box? I got to keep that closed so I have full screen on my end. Do you have a chat box? I certainly do. If anyone has questions, just go ahead and type them in um, and I'll, I'll get you a response. And let's start with this. My attendees, if you don't mind giving us a thumbs up or something, we want to make sure you can hear us okay and see us okay so if you could give us a thumbs up or anything just to confirm and then sam let me know if you get a confirmation from anybody from the attendees that they can see and hear us Uh oh. Sam, you still got me? I'm still here, Pete. Can we hear from any of the attendees? Can they see, hear us? Um, yeah, I'm getting some stuff basically saying all is good. Beautiful. All right, then we will get started. I'm going to give it another minute. People are still logging on, folks. Give me one more minute. I want to. Value your time for joining us promptly, but uh, we just got a few people uh, still logging on. So give me one minute and we will get started. Oh, Sam, I accidentally just butt dialed you. Sorry about that. You could ignore me. If only. <laughs> All right. On that note, what's happened, everybody? Peter Linto with you. I'm so glad you made the time to come tonight. Um, you are going to get a lot out of this session, my level two friends, or if there's anyone on level one and you're uh, previewing some of the content, what it look like for level two, you're in the right place. I, 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 Sam, I had a little typo here, man. I passed every level on the first attempt. Let's go. So I'm a professional test taker, folks. But what I can assure you, is if we had a two-tailed distribution of the IQs on this call right now, my IQ more likely than not would be in the left tail, but my work ethic is in the right tail. And that's honestly the difference between success and failure on the different parts of the CPA, different levels of the CFA, as well as when I took the bar exam. Um, just as an FYI, you know what they say, each level approximately 300 hours, but that's just an approximation, right? So sometimes it could be less depending upon your background, and sometimes it's going to be more than 300 hours, again, depending upon your background. Uh, if there's any level one candidates on here, I uh, just want to let you know level two is like level one, except it's on steroids. So it's a much deeper dive into many of the concepts we introduced in level one. Um, obviously, level two, we've chosen a topic in equity because it's uh, the most heavily tested topic or amongst the most heavily tested topics in level two. Uh, we are very, very happy you joined us tonight. So we got a couple of QR codes. I'll show them again on the back end at the end. But uh, if anybody's looking to join us at UWorld as a thank you for attending tonight's uh, webinar, uh, happy to um, extend this uh, discount to all of you. And you're welcome to share it if you'd like with any friends or family or colleagues or anybody out there. And um, I will put this back up on the back end. OK, folks, so uh, what we're going to do tonight, I'm going to do a little bit of two things. Um, number one, I want to work questions. Right. So at the end of the day, uh, we got to be able to solve problems. So these are a little bit more an individual multiple choice format. It just allows us to cover a lot more ground versus a vignette where it's a deep dive. But I'll show you how, as we go through these questions, how they can create a vignette, you know, and break this into a series of questions. So um, 
Bear with me, but uh, residual income model is where we're starting. So if I'm taking the exam and I see that it's a residual income question, I'm thinking the intrinsic value of this company today, IV, is the book value of that equity today. And that's part of the reason why we love the residual income model. A lot of the value we see today is attributed to book value we actually have right in front of us. So it's not some forecasted future amount where we have to discount back to today. What we're gonna have to estimate is the sum of the present value of all that value added into perpetuity. So we're gonna want the sum of the present value of that residual income. So anytime I see residual income model, I start with this formula and then we're gonna plug in as we go. The big issue is gonna be how to calculate the sum of the present value of that future residual income. So here we go. We've got, um, let's see, HPK, uh, they have a three-year contract. It's expected to earn 250, 350, and five per share during the next three years. And it plans on paying dividends of $1, $2, and $18. So they've made life a lot easier for me in that they've given me these amounts rather than requiring me to calculate them. We'll have more advanced problems. We'll actually have to calculate that. Okay, the last dividend includes a liquidating payment to share shareholders. The company's going to sell off its assets at the end of the three years. So we're going to have a liquidating dividend. You'll see why that's very important in just one second. Okay, they tell us the book value today, there's one piece of the puzzle. So what we're looking for now is that we have the book value is what's the sum of the present value of the residual income. When you practice questions, folks, the goal is to review the rule in its entirety. So even though certain amounts were given here, what if they weren't? How would I solve for this? So this is what I'm gonna suggest you do. We've got a book value per share today of 10, agreed given information. Normally, I would multiply that by the return on equity in that first year to get my earnings per share subscript one all righty but that was given information the earnings per share subscript one that's this 250 all right so obviously your return on equity in year one was 25 percent all right but they gave us the eps subscript one now my book value per share 10 times my dividend payout or excuse me my cost of common equity what is my required rate of return on that common equity given information 12%. So while we had a 25% rate of return, we would have been happy with a 12% rate of return. So that hurdle, we would have preferred, or excuse me, not that we would prefer it, but we have a benchmark, a minimum required return of that cost of common equity of 12%. Hopefully, we could generate a return in excess of that, and we have. EPS subscript one is 250 we needed a minimum of $1.20. So what is our residual income subscript one difference between 250 and $1.20? We got 130. Now, I wanna take that book value per share that we started with, 10. So I got my residual income. I wanna add my earnings per share that year, 250. I wanna subtract my dividend in year one, they gave me the dividend. We don't have to calculate it. The dividend was given as a dollar. If they don't give you the dividend, then that would be your earnings per share that year, which was 250 times the payout rate. Now we could back into the payout rate, but we don't need to. So what is my book value per share therefore at the end of that first year? Well, it went up by 250, but then we paid out a dollar. So that gets me book value per share, 1150. End of year one, okay, becomes the beginning of the next year. So book value per share, subscript one is 1150. We repeat the process, times return on equity for the second year, but we don't need that because they gave us our dividend, excuse me, our earnings per share in the second year is 350. So EPS subscript two, give it information, 350. Book value per share, beginning of the year, 1150 times a hurdle of 12%. That gets us a required rate of return. I got approximately $1.38. So we wanted a minimum earnings per share, one, uh, $1.38 management did great. They got us more than that. So my residual income subscript two 
The difference between the 350 and the dollar 38, 212. So we have another piece of the puzzle. Book value per share at the start of that year was 1150. We added EPS of 350, and then we paid out a dividend. Our second dividend, given information, we don't have to solve for it. Our second dividend was two bucks or two pounds. We got two. If they did not give us that, then that would be the EPS in that second year, 350 times your payout rate. Okay, but they gave us the two bucks. So now we have book value per share, subscript two, 1150 plus the 350 minus the two, 13. Final year of operations. Book value per share at the end of year two is the same thing as the beginning of year three, right? So end of year two, we now have 13. Times my return on equity for the third year, they didn't give me that, but they gave me something better. EPS, subscript three, was given information, that was five. Take the beginning book value, hurdle rate of 12%. We would have liked to have at least $1.56 or 1.56 pounds. We got five. So residual income, subscript three, 344. We have another piece of the puzzle. Okay, my book value per share, start of year three, end of year two, 13. Plus my EPS in year three, five. Now remember, key point here, we have a liquidating dividend payment, folks, liquidating dividends. So now they're gonna pay out a dividend of 18. How did I get 18? Liquidating. So the 15, 13 plus the five is the 18, 18 minus 18, book value per share, therefore at the end of year three is zero. So we have a liquidating dividend at the end of year three of 18. All righty, so now what we're gonna do is, we're not gonna do fractions, it takes too long. So to solve this a little bit faster, this is what I'm gonna have you all do. Enter in your calculator, cash flow subscript one, which is that first residual income, 130. Cash flow two, residual income subscript two, the 212. Cash flow three, is residual income three plus the terminal value of any residual income. Residual income three is 3.44. And what's the terminal value of all future residual income? The terminal value of all future residual income is zero. Why is it zero? Because we paid out that liquidating dividend and that's it, the company's done with operations. So cash flow subscript three is the 344. Discount that all back at our cost of common equity, 12%, and solve for the sum of the present value of those future cash flows, we get an intrinsic value of 530. So that works out to be 530. Enter cash flow one, two, three. Discount it all back at 12%. You get an intrinsic value of 530. So the sum of the present value of all future residual income, 530, add that to the beginning book value of 10, 1530. Correct answer, choice C. And notice what dominates that intrinsic value is today's book value. All righty, two thirds of that book value is coming from things we can see today. All right, so that's a good thing. 67% of that value is attributed to book value we can see today. That's an advantage. Now, you should get approximately the same answer if you did a dividend discount model. If we did a dividend discount model, dividend subscript one was given information. Dividend one was a dollar. Dividend two, two dollars. Dividend three was a liquidating dividend of 18. So dividend one, a dollar. Dividend two, two dollars. Dividend three, 18 liquidating so we pay it all out whatever that ending book value per share is the ending book value per share gets paid out in the form of a dividend discount that all back at 12 percent what intrinsic value do you get 1530 notice same result as the residual income model just a different format same result all right, so sometimes you can move even faster 
<laughs> by just plugging in those dividends. All right, so that's not a coincidence. That should happen. So let's try another one. Value added, one down, lots to go. Sam, if there's any questions along the way, feel free to interrupt me, my friend. Well, we just had one of our uh, attendees who asked you, and this may be something that you're going to get to, but um, for a multi-stage model, he just wanted to know how many periods you would discount terminal value. Um, and also if there was um, something where involving a persistence factor. So Yeah, we're going to show all the different ways. So I'm, I love these questions. So folks, the terminal value of the residual income, you guys read my mind. There are four methods by which we can estimate the terminal value. You want to see? You want to see how? Sam, if, 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 did I prepare or did I prepare? Look at this. We have four ways, four methods to calculate the terminal value of our residual income. Four different assumptions. Okay, we're going to get to all of those. I promise you I have questions, problems that illustrate each one of those. But we're jumping ahead. I love it. I love their enthusiasm. Sam, this is a beautiful group. No argument here. <laughs> all right, let's try another one. You ready? They want to know, hey, based on this information, they don't want the value of the company. Unlike the prior question where they were looking for the actual value of the company, using a residual income model. In this question I'm showing you, they simply want to know, hey, what is your residual income? Now, residual income, there's a variety of different ways of calculating it, but at the end of the day, most common net income. Tell me what the beginning book value of common equity was, net income for the period, minus the beginning book value of common equity, times your cost of common equity. Okay, there's a variety of different ways we could do this. We could also take the spread between our return on equity, our cost of common equity, and multiply that by the beginning book value of common equity. So you're gonna see a, a variety of different ways of solving for this. Okay, the way you solve is gonna be dependent upon the facts, but watch this. Hold on one second. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm so excited. All right. Another way to calculate residual income is to take your notepad, net operating profit after tax, your EBIT times one minus your tax rate, subtract from that your total capital times your weighted average cost of capital and economic value added, but same result, different format. Okay, you're gonna get the exact same result any of these approaches, okay? So let's see what we got here. American Fawcett had EBIT of 150, stop right there. They gave me one piece of the puzzle, EBIT of 150. They tell me during the period, interest expense was 20. So let's do a little income statement. EBIT 150 minus my interest. 20, that gets me earnings before tax. 130. Multiply that by one minus the tax rate. There's my net income. So I'm scanning what is my tax rate? 35%. Multiply the 130 by 65%. How much of that falls to the bottom line? My net income. 84.5. 84.5. Okay, what else do they tell us? Uh, the book value and market value of their common equity at the beginning of 2014. So the book value of their common equity, beginning of 2014, 500. I want the beginning value. Okay, we're asking for what year, 2014. Okay, so my beginning book value of common equity, 500. <laughs> and I just want to keep track of my debt and my equity. Debt had a book value of 200 million at the beginning and end of 2014. So folks, my total capital is 700 million. Total capital and total assets are similar, but technically not the same thing. I mean, technically total capital 
is your debt plus your equity, your interest bearing debt, your financing liabilities, and your equity could be preferred equity, common equity, that's your total capital. And then there's a book value of capital and there's a market value for that capital. Total capital is really your total assets minus your operating liabilities, your non-interest bearing obligations. That's technically total capital, but here we're estimating. So total assets, 700, we'll say our total capital is approximately 700. So we have another piece of the puzzle. We know our tax rate is 35%, so I can calculate NOPAT 150 times 65%. My NOPAT is 97.5. My total capital is 700. Now I'm going to need my weighted average cost of capital. We'll get there. Let's see, did they give me my cost of common equity? The cost of debt is 10%, so their pre-tax cost of debt, 10%. Multiply that by one minus the tax rate, one minus 35%. 65%, so 6.5 after tax cost of debt, 6.5%. So we will use that when we calculate WAC. What's my cost of equity? 11.5. Okay, let's solve now for one way of calculating our residual income. 500 times 11.5%. 11.5 is our hurdle as a rate. In dollars, what's the minimum level of net income we need to maintain our current valuation? Well, 500 times 0.115, that works out to be, I got 57.5. So let me just squeeze that over here. Let me move that down a little bit, keep it neat. 500 times 11.5%. 57.5. So my residual income, my value added 27 million. Let's see if we can get that same thing by doing no PAT minus SWAC. The total capital, 700, the debt plus the equity and approximation of the book value of our capital. Now, what's our weighted average cost of capital? Well, let's see. We said we have debt of 200, we have equity of 500. Well, 200 divided by 700 is what percent? 28.5% of our capital came from debt. 500 divided by 700, 71.43% of our capital came from equity. Cost of debt, multiply that by your after-tax cost of debt, not pre-tax. Weighted 1.857. Our cost of equity was 11.5%. Weighted 8.214. Add that together. What's our weighted average cost of capital? 10.07. So 0 0.1007. So our net operating profit after tax, 97.5 minus our hurdle using WAC and the return to all suppliers of capital. Debt and equity, that's 97.5. Well, 700 times 0 0.1007, 70.49, approximately 70.5. So what's the difference? Economic value added, same result, different format, 27 million. All righty. So whether you do no PAT minus SWAC or you do your net income minus your hurdle, your book value of common equity at the beginning of the period times that cost of common equity or the spread between your return on equity and your cost of common equity times your beginning book value of common equity. Our cost of common equity was 11.5%, agreed? What was our actual return on equity? Well, our net income was 84.5. Divide that by our beginning book value of common equity, 500, 84.5 divided by I can't read my own handwriting. You got to love it. Write neatly. 84.5 divided by 500 at 16.9%. So our net income for the period, book value of common equity beginning of the period, and that's an ugly 500. Let's make that a little bit neater. 
So the spread between 16.9% and 11.5%. That's a spread of 5.4 times the 500, 27. So that's a spread. Folks, this is the key to the residual income model. Can management get a return on equity greater than their cost of common equity? What is the spread between their return on equity and their cost of common equity? That's the key. Okay, two down, lots and lots to go. Sam, are you enjoying this? How you feeling, Sam? You love this stuff or what? Cat's got his tongue. All righty. Start with the question stem, not the facts, because we don't need to, we don't know what to do with those facts. They want to know what's the firm's market value added. The firm's market value added. Tell me what the fair market value is for the capital. The fair market value for the debt plus the fair market value for the equity, common and preferred, minus the book value of the capital. The book value for the debt plus the book value for the equity. The difference is the market value being added. Okay, so let's see what we got here. They tell us an analyst is valuing a firm with a book value of $17 per share. Okay, so that's $17 per share. I want to multiply that by the number of common shares outstanding. They got a return on equity of 10% and a required rate of return of nine. So return on equity, 10, minus cost the common equity, nine. We only have a spread of a plus 1%. Multiply that by the beginning book value of common equity, and therein lies your residual income. Now, they didn't ask for that, but just pointing it out. Okay, the firm has 20 million common shares outstanding. So here we go. 17 times 20, book value of the equity, 340, dropping the zeros. Fair market value of the equity on a per share basis. They're trading at $30 a share. $30 per share times the 20 million shares outstanding. That's a fair market value of six. They tell me their debt outstanding. They have to pay 6.5% interest. The debt is recorded. 350 on the balance sheet. That's the book value of the debt. 350, 350 plus the 340, 690. That's the book value of my capital. The debt is recorded though, but it's trading at 400 million. So we got 1 billion minus 690 million. What's the market value added? 310 million dollars. $310 million, that's the market value being added, okay? That's the market value being added. Now, if we just take a look at, um, let's see, the fair market value of the equity was 600, right? The $30 per share times the 20 million shares outstanding minus the book value of the equity. The book value of the equity, $17 per share times the same 20 million shares, that's 340. So the difference between the fair market value and the book value of the equity, that works out to be 260, okay? So if we found the intrinsic value of this company, Assuming intrinsic value and fair market value, let's say it's efficiently priced, okay? If I give you that information, it's efficiently priced. The intrinsic value, the book value of the common equity, plus the sum of the present value of all future residual income, that economic value added, 260. What was the book value? The book value was how much? Book value of the equity? was 340. What's the 340 plus the 260? The intrinsic value, okay? So when you just isolate the equity, 
The difference between the fair market value and the book value, call it, according to the residual income model, is the sum of the present value of all that future economic value added, okay, discounted back to today. All right. Let's try another one. Let's jump ahead here. I got some good ones for you. Sam, any questions here at this point before I do our next one? I wish I could see the chat box, but if I open up the chat, then I can't see anything. Anything, Sam, for me? Hello? I'm going to say no. Sam, are you still there? Is anybody there? Holy crap. Hello? Sam. <laughs> oh, wow, I hope I'm still going. Hello? Let me see if Sam texted me. Sorry, guys. Sam, are you still there? I just texted Sam. All right. So our next one, which of the following statements regarding the residual income valuation model, which of these is most accurate? Which of these is a true statement? If residual income is forecast to be zero, then the forecasted fundamental price to book value will be zero. Wait a second, what's price to book value? You guys remember how to do price to book, book justified? Justified price to book value. How do we get that justified price to book? Well, our price, intrinsic value, what's one way we could come up with that using the Gordon growth model, right? Forecast the dividend divided by your cost of common equity minus your growth, assuming the company has reached that constant growth into perpetuity, right? So it's slowed to the point where we can maintain that growth level into perpetuity and your cost of common equity has got to exceed your growth. And you got to be a mature company that regularly pays the dividend, blah, 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 blah. Okay, what's another way to rewrite that numerator? Forecasted EPS times your payout divided by R minus G, right? What's another way to write forecasted EPS? Our return on equity for the period times our book value at the beginning of the period. What's another way to write payout? One minus your retention rate is another way to write payout, right? Synonymous? Divided by R minus G. Now let's divide both sides by book value. What are we left with? Return on equity times one minus the retention rate divided by R minus G. That can be simplified to return on equity times one. Return on equity times the retention rate is your growth divided by R minus G. So what drives price to book value? The justified amount, what we should be trading at. The spread between return on equity and the cost of common equity. The bigger the spread, right, the more valuable this company should be. What are we indifferent about? Growth. Because on the one hand, we want a smaller denominator. So we want high growth in the denominator, but we want a larger numerator to have a higher justified price to book. So growth, I don't care if you retain it or pay it out. Value is driven by the spread between your return on equity and your cost of common equity. Agreed? Okay. So, folks, residual income, if that is zero, that means your return on equity equals your cost of common equity. Therefore, your justified price to book value, both the numerator and the denominator are one and the same, price to book value would be what? One. If there's no spread, it wouldn't be zero. It would be one. What if the residual income is positive, meaning your return on equity is greater than your cost of common equity? You're creating value. Then our justified price to book would be greater than one. The numerator would be bigger than the denominator. Agreed? If residual income is negative. We got to fire that board. That means we are destroying value. Your return on equity, your numerator 
is smaller than your denominator. That means your justified price to book value would therefore be less than one. All right, so which of these is true? If residual income is forecast to be zero, it wouldn't be less than one, it would be one. If residual income is forced, forecasted to be zero, return on equity equals your cost of common equity, then our numerator equals our denominator, justify price to book would be one. All righty, another one down. Let's try another one. Sam, are you back? Hello, hello. Sam, are you there? Hello, hello. All right, hopefully Sam is there. Hopefully you guys are there. Somebody's there. Let's try another one. They want to know what's the implied growth rate priced into these shares. Do not solve for X. Do not memorize another formula. Do not memorize. Okay, plug and go. Don't do algebra. It takes too long. So the implied growth rate, you ready? They tell me the company has a book value of 30. Return on equity is 14. Payout is 40. Cost of equity is 10. The shares have a market price of 50. Stop right there. The price in the market is the sum of the book value of the common equity today plus the sum of the present value of all future residual income. Book value today is 30. They told me the price in the market is 50. Then what does the market believe the sum of the present value of the future residual income must be? 50 minus the 30, then we can infer that the market believes that the sum of the present value of the residual income is 20, okay? Now, just simply backing into the growth by plugging four, six, or 8.4, the sum of the present value of the residual income, if we have constant growth in residual income now and forever, then the sum of the present value of the residual income, 20, would be residual income subscript 1 divided by R minus G. Okay. Now, what is our forecasted residual income? Well, how are we going to solve for it here? They gave us the return on equity of 14, the cost of common equity of 10. Our return on equity minus our cost of common equity, the value created, 14 minus 10. 4% times the beginning book value of common equity. What is the beginning book value of common equity, did we say? 30. Given information, 30. So what's our residual income? $1.2.20. We have our numerator. Did they give us our cost of common equity? Yes, they did. 10%. What must our growth be? Okay, don't solve for X, it takes too long. What value for growth will get you $20 as the sum of the present value of the residual income? So let me try A. If I plug A in, 0 0.04, if it's not A, now look, you could start with the middle value, all righty, and then, if it's, it, then you can infer whether it's got to be higher or lower. All right, but I'm just going to start with A just to prove my point. You don't ever have to work more, more than two. You can start with the middle value, but I'm just going to pop in the 4%. $1.20 divided by 6%, does that equal 20? Yes, it does. It's got to be choice A. All right, if you pick the number too high, if instead you put in the 6%, 0 0.10 minus 0 0.06, if that's too high, then you're going to get something less than 20. If you got something less than 20, then you know it's got to be the choice that is lower than 6%, the 4%. But there's no reason to memorize additional formulas here, folks. Just plug and go. Okay. Let's try another one. Let's see what we got. There's a good one. Take a second. Take a picture of it. Read it. Okay, you can stop wherever you are. We want intrinsic value per share. Okay, intrinsic value per share. So they tell us, let's see, um, the company has a current book value of 35. 
They got a return on equity of 14. They think that's going to continue for three years. So they're going to have return on equity of 14% for N equal to three years. At that point, they don't know what's going to happen to return on equity. The share price was at a, a persistent 10% premium of book, book value. And he assumes this will be the case at the end of the three-year forecast. However, management has maintained an average market value over book value. That's what we're going to use, that 30%. Okay. So prior to last year, the share price was 10% premium over book value. That is distractor information. We know that management historically, reversion to mean, has maintained an average market price over book value of 30%. So this is going to be one of four methods of calculating the terminal value of our residual income. Okay, the terminal value of our residual income. All right. Now, they tell us the dividend payout rate is 30, cost of common equity is 10.2. So intrinsic value is the sum of the book value of common equity today plus the sum of the present value of all future residual income. I'm going to be able to I'm going to be able to calculate the residual income for 3 years and then I want to calculate the terminal value of the residual income at the end of the third period. Okay, after the forecast horizon as you're going to see. All right. So the book value of common equity today $35 a share. So we've got one piece of the puzzle. We need the sum of the present value of all future residual income. Now, what I'm showing you, more likely than not in a vignette, you'd have separate questions calculating residual income subscript one, subscript two, subscript three. And then they don't want you to carry your mistake over. So a follow-up question might be, well, okay, now given, assume residual income one, two, and three or X, Y, and Z. All right, this way you don't carry a mistake over, but they could break this into multiple questions. All right, so my book value per share today is 35. What did they say our return on equity was going to be? Return on equity, 14% for three years. So let's multiply that by 14%. I'm going to get an EPS for the first year of 490. I'm now going to take my book value per share today, 35, multiply it by my cost of common equity, 0 0.102. So I have a hurdle in dollars of 357. That's my hurdle in dollars. So residual income subscript one, 133. Okay, then I take that book value per share, subscript zero, 35. I add my EPS of 490. I now want to subtract out the dividend in year one. How would I do that? My EPS that year times my payout rate. Well, what's my EPS that year? 490. What did they say our payout rate was going to be? Payout rate, 30%. So my dividend that year would be 147. So that means my book value per share at the end of the first year, 3843. Now all you got to do Follow that same procedure, 38.43 times 14%. What's our earnings per share for year two? EPS year two, 538. Take that 38.43, multiply it by your hurdle, 0 0.102, 10.2%. Minimum return required of 392, residual income subscript two, therefore is 146. Book value per share, year one, beginning of year one, um, let's see, 38.43, excuse me, end of year one, same thing as the beginning of year two, plus our earnings per share that year, 538, minus our dividend, 538, times 30%, 1.614, Book value per share, end of year two, 42.196. End of year two becomes the beginning of year three, 42.196. Want a 14% rate of return, EPS subscript three 
is there for 591. All righty. Now with 42.196, sorry about that, 42.196 times a hurdle of 10.2%, our hurdle in dollars, 430. So we were able to produce residual income of 161. Book value per share, beginning of year two, 42.196, plus our earnings per share, 591 minus our dividend, 591 times 30%, $1.77. Book value per share, at the end of year three, 46.33. So I have residual income Years one, two, and three, right there. All righty. Now they tell me that the company averages a market value over book value of 30%. So, folks, the market value of this company then, 46.33 times 1.3, the market value would be 60.24. And with a book value of only 46.33, the terminal value of our residual income at the end of year three, 13.91. That is the terminal value of our residual income at the end of year three. So again, that's one of four methodologies to come up with the terminal value of that residual income. Okay, now let's find the sum of the present value of all future residual income. So using your financial calculator, cash flow subscript one is your first residual income, 133. Enter your second cash flow. Second residual income, 1.46. Cash flow subscript three is gonna be residual income for year three plus the terminal value of all residual income at the end of year three. So residual income year three, 161 plus the terminal value of residual income, 1391. Add those two together, cash flow subscript three is 1552. Enter 133, 146, 1552 if you would, and enter a discount rate of 10.2%. Solve for the sum of the present value of all future residual income. Solve for the sum of the present value of all future residual income. I get 14, I get 14. Take that 14, pop it in here, beginning book value 35 plus the 14, 49, and whoop, there it is. Okay, there it is. Sam, you there, Sam, can you hear me? Hello, hello. Sorry guys, I sorry, cannot- Sorry, I had, to, I had to unmute, My apologies. Yes, I am here. Oh, any questions? Nope, nope, so far we're okay. Beautiful, beautiful. Okay, so folks, what I'm gonna do now that you have this, I'm gonna change the facts. I'm gonna show you just a couple of other common ways we might get that terminal value of the residual income at the end of year three. This methodology is, hey, the company's gonna be trading at a 30% premium over its book value, okay, at the end of year three. Book value 4633, 30% tr premium 6024. Well, 6024 over the book value, that's a premium of 1391. That is due to the terminal value of all future residual income that we're going to see going forward 1391 at the end of year three. All righty. Let me change the facts here now. Let me give you a couple of other scenarios. You ready? I'm going to change the facts now. Let me just get a blank space here. I'm going to change the facts. You ready? Change facts. Terminal, terminal value at the end of year three, if there's constant growth of 3% at the end of year three, then how would we find the terminal value of the residual income at the end of year three? I would need my residual income year three times one plus the constant growth divided by your cost of common equity minus that constant growth. My residual income year three was 161, given a constant growth rate of 3%, 0 0.102 minus 3%, 1.2, 1.2, 1.2, 1.2, 1.2, 1.2, 1.2, 1.2, 1.2, 1.2, 1.2, 1.2, 1.2, 1.2, 1.2, 1.2, 1.2, 1.
What would we get? 2303. So residual income one, no change, $1.33. Residual income two, no change, 146. But residual income three plus the terminal value of your residual income three. Residual income three, 161. But now we would be adding 2303 to that amount. Okay, and then you would solve for it the same way. $1.61, one point, sorry about that, folks, 1.61 plus the 23.03, 24.64, enter your discount rate of 10.2%, one, two, three gets entered and then solve. And I'm sure you could do that on your own. Okay. Change the facts again. What if they tell us? What if you're given that the return on equity for year four and beyond is going to be 12%? Return on equity year four and beyond is going to be 12%. So I would take my book value per share, the end of year three, beginning of year four, same thing as the end of year three, 46.33 times that return on equity, 12%. EPS, year four, 556. 46.33 times 10.2%, your cost of common equity, 4.73. Residual income, therefore, year four, 0.83. Okay, so now I got residual income year four. And they tell me we're going to have a persistence factor of, let's say, 90%. A persistence factor of 90%. Well, then the terminal value of my residual income at the end of year three, residual income subscript four, divided by one plus my cost of common equity minus that persistence factor. So then the terminal value of my residual income in year three, take my residual income year four, 1.102 minus a persistence factor of 0.9. My terminal value for my residual income, 4.11. Residual income one and two would not change. Residual income three, 161 plus now the terminal value of my residual income, only 411, you would enter cash flow subscript three would then be the sum of your 161 and your 411, 572. Okay, so cash flows one and two would not change. Cash flow three would be the same residual income three, but now a terminal value. So you see there's a variety of different ways they could give you information, okay, and necessary to solve the terminal value of your residual income, all right? So we'll try more examples in just uh, a second here. Okay, um, let's see. The next one I wanted to do, I just want to do part of this guy. So um, let's see. I want to do, let me see the question. What's the question? Uh, I want to do this question. Based on the information in Exhibit 1, what would be calculated as an intrinsic value per share? Okay, so Exhibit 1, here's Exhibit 1. Okay, so here's our information, Exhibit 1. So our given information, and we're using our residual income model. So as soon as I see that intrinsic value, I got my beginning book value of common equity, plus the sum of the present value of all future residual income. Okay, my current book value is 20. We pop that in. Okay, now I need the sum of the present value of all future residual income. I got a return on equity of 12. What else do we got? We got a cost to common equity of 10. We got a payout rate of 30. We have a persistence factor of 0.75. Okay, so there's my given information for this set of facts. They tell us, um, let's see, 
We have a market leadership position, uh, position. We forecast that the first three years out, we can use that residual income model, okay? And then we're gonna have that persistence factor of 0.75. So let's calculate our value now. You ready? Just gonna move this over, give myself some room. Okay, so again, book value per share today, 20. Return on equity times 12%. EPS subscript one, 240. Book value per share of 20, cost of common equity of 10. We were hoping for a minimum, our hurdle was two. So residual income subscript one is 40. Take that book value per share of 20, add that earnings per share to 40. And then what's our payout? 240, projected payout of 30%. 240 times 30%, 0 0.72, there's my dividend. 240 minus 0 0.72, book value per share, end of year one, 21.68. Repeat it, 21.68 times 12%, we're gonna get an earnings per share of approximately 260. 21.68 times a hurdle of 10%. We were hoping for 2.168 approximately. Residual income subscript two, 0.432. We started out with a book value per share of 21.68. We just added EPS of 240. And then we're going to have a dividend of 240 times 30% of 78 cents, giving us a book value per share at the end of year two, same thing as beginning of year three, 23.50. And folks, I'm just gonna move this up. Sorry about that, I wanna give myself some room here. So our intrinsic value today, book value of common equity 20 plus the sum of the present value of all future residual income. Take that 2350. We're going to earn 12%. That's going to get me 282. 2350 times 10%. 235 is my hurdle in dollars. Residual income subscript 3.47. Sorry about that. 0.47. Take that book value per share, 23.50. Add your earnings per share, 282. There's your earnings. Subtract your dividends. Your dividends in year three, 282 times 30%, 0 0.846. That gets us a book value per share now at the end of year three of 2547. Okay, now they tell us we have a persistence factor of 75%. So my terminal value for the residual income at the end of year three will be the residual income one year forward one plus my cost of common equity minus my persistence factor. Okay, minus my persistence factor. All righty. So they give me no information about the, what the return on equity is going to be in the fourth year. So absent any other information, we're going to use that same 12%. They did not give me something different. If they gave me something different, a return on equity, Oh, they actually did, 12% years one through year four. So here's year one, year two, year three. They actually tell it. All right, so take your 2547. We are gonna have a return on equity again of 12%. Unlike my example where I changed it, here they're telling you keep the 12%. EPS 3.056, 2547 times a hurdle of 10%. 2.547, 
That gets you residual income subscript 4.509. So they told you the return on equity, you could use that same number through year four. Okay. If they want to change it, they'll change it. Okay. So 0.509, one plus my cost of common equity. They gave me a persistence factor of 75%. Terminal value of my residual income, 1.45. So using your financial calculator, cash flow subscript one will be residual income 1.40. Cash flow two, residual income two, 0.432. Cash flow three, residual income three, 0.43 plus the terminal value. So that's gonna be residual income in the third year plus the terminal value of all the residual income at the end of year three, 0.43. Uh, excuse me, 0.47, that should be, my bad. 0.47, residual income subscript three, plus the terminal value, 145, that's 192. So please enter 0 0.40, 0 0.432, 1.92, discount it back at your cost of common equity. The sum of the present value of all future residual income, 2.163. Pop that in here, 2.163, so 22.16. That's going to be our intrinsic value, 22.16. Closest to, notice, closest to with rounding, you could get a little bit of a difference, okay? Now, let's take a look at this. It's continuation of the same problem. What if return on equity remains at 12% forever? It never changes, okay? So intrinsic value will be equal to the beginning book value of common equity, same facts, 20, plus the sum of the present value of the residual income that's now going to change given this new information, okay? So they tell us, hey, what is the implied growth rate? Well, let's see, based on the current market price. All right, so I don't have to solve for intrinsic value. Here, they're telling me, what must the market be assuming given that the shares are currently trading at 28.58? So similar to the problem we did before. So now this is given information, except this is the actual price in the market. Well, 28.58, minus 20, that means the sum of the present value of all the future residual income must be 8.58, okay? And the sum of the present value of the residual income, we can use the constant growth model because the 12% return on equity is gonna last into perpetuity, okay? So that'll be residual income, subscript one, Divided by your cost of common equity minus implied growth. Well, we already calculated residual income subscript one. They would probably tell you on the exam to assume a particular number so you don't carry over a mistake. But we know this is 0 0.40. We know that this is 0 0.10. What must the growth rate be such that the sum of the present value of the future residual income is 858? Okay, 858. Well, now just, just work backwards. Okay, just work backwards. So let's try choice B. Let's try the middle value. Okay, this time let's try the middle value. See what we get, 5.3. So if I take 0 0.40 divided by 0 0.10 minus 0 0.053, plug and go, take your middle value, what do you get? 8.51, close enough. Close enough, choice B. Because if you change it by two points in either direction, you're going to get a much bigger number, a much different number. All righty, so we're going to go with choice B. Okay. We are rocking and rolling, baby. Rocking oh, and rolling. Hey, sorry, Cindy, before, before you continue, uh, there were a couple of user comments or questions. I uh, apologies for not seeing these previously. One of them was 
Uh, why do we add back EPS and subtract dividends? Because you need the book value per share at the end of one year to find what it is at the beginning of the next year. Okay. So I have to do this step here to get what my earnings per share will be in the beginning of the next year, because that'll dictate what my earnings per share are in that next year, because we're getting a constant return on equity, but of a different, a growing book value of common equity. So that's why we have to calculate the change in the book value per share. Earnings per share makes it go up, the dividends make it go down. And one other question related, I think, to that same question that you were working, why is year four residual income calculated at that point, I think is what the user meant, and then discounted back three periods? So my residual income, so for example here, I'm using residual income in year four as my numerator to find my terminal value of residual income at the end of year three. So remember, the value of anything today, a dividend discount model, that's dividend subscript one, constant growth. If I want the intrinsic value at the end of year five, then I need the dividend in year six, right? There's your intrinsic value year five. So in a dividend discount model, your terminal year cash flow, your terminal year cash flow, the dividend in that last year plus the terminal value in that last year. Same thing with the residual income model. Your terminal year cash flow is your last residual income plus the terminal value of that residual income. So I got to find the residual income in year four so that I could find my terminal value at the end of year three. The terminal value of my residual income in year three plus my residual income in year three is my total cash flow in year three. Got it? Remember, there's a difference between your terminal value and the present value of your terminal value, okay? Here I'm finding my terminal value at the end of year three. That's why that's gotta be discounted back three years, just like with the dividend discount model. Okay, bear with me. I'm gonna do some more basic questions in a little bit and I'll, and I'll, I'll, re I'll find another example of that. I got a good one coming up. All righty, let's try another one. Let's do, let's try this one. Take a second, take a picture of it, and hopefully this will help clear it up. All right, they tell me the current book value of the shares is 35. Assuming return on equity will fade towards the cost of common equity over time, what's our intrinsic value per share? All right, so again, we're gonna be doing our residual income model. So my intrinsic value, my book value today, 35 plus the sum of the present value of all future residual income. So watch this closely now. You ready? They tell me, we're looking at a company they tell us they think the shares will sell at a 30% premium over book value. Instead, he has been told, assume that the return on equity in year four will be 12% and that it will slowly decline towards the cost of common equity to 10.2 using a persistence factor of 0.7. So we're not going to be doing the premium of 30%. We're not. Instead, we're going to be using a persistence factor to find the terminal value of the residual income. Okay, he believes that the persistence factor, 0.7 in addition, residual income prediction, predictions, you ready? We got residual income subscript one, $1.33. I've got residual income subscript two, $1.46. I got residual income subscript three of 161. Okay, that's all given information. We didn't have to solve for that like we did in the other problems. Now what I need is the terminal value of my residual income at the end of year three. How am I gonna find that terminal value of that residual income at the end of year three? Well, that's gonna be based upon the residual income in year four 
discounted back at one plus my cost of common equity minus my persistence factor. Okay. Now, my book value projected book value per share end of year three, which is the same thing as the book value per share at the beginning of year four. This is given information, given 46.34. Everybody with me on that? 46.34. I need to calculate that numerator. What is my residual income in year four so I can find the terminal value of my residual income at the end of year three. You ready? So they tell me return on equity. What did we think our return on equity could be for four years? Well, they say in year four, they think it would be 12%. I don't care about years one, two, and three. The only thing that's relevant is what they're giving me for year four, 12%. 46, 34 times 12%, my EPS. Year four, 556. With a book value per share of 46.34, what was I hoping to get? What's my cost of common equity? Well, they tell me my cost of common equity, 10.2% times 0.102, my cost of common equity. What's my hurdle in dollars? I got 4.726, 4.726. So therefore, what is my residual income in year four? 0 0.833, 0 0.833. One plus my cost of common equity, 0 0.102, minus my persistence factor, 0 0.70. What's the terminal value of my residual income? 2.07. 161 plus 2.07. What's my total cash flow? 368. So do me a favor, please enter $1.33, $1.46, 368, and please discount all of that at 10.26, excuse me, 10.2%. What is the sum of the present value of all my future residual income? 515. 515. So 515 plus the 35. What's my intrinsic value? 4015. Now watch this for a second, because this is the exact same rules we're applying to a dividend discount model. So everybody's got that? Sam, are they good? Okay, watch how this is the same thing as a dividend dis a multi-stage dividend discount model. Look at this. What if I told you today's dividend was $2? I'm going to have a growth rate high of 25% for three years. Then I'm going to have constant growth thereafter, constant growth of 3%. Okay. Let's say my cost of common equity is, I don't know, we'll make it 11%. What would be the intrinsic value of this stock using a dividend discount model? A two-stage dividend discount model. You ready? Take today's dividend, $2, multiply it by 1.25. Do it with me. $2 times 1.25. We'd have a dividend. There's dividend subscript one. Take that 250, grow it again by 25%. 3.125, there is dividend two. Dividend three, 3.125 times growth of 25%. 3.91 approximately, there is dividend three. All right, so we have G high, of 25% for N equals to three periods. All righty. Now, how do I find my terminal value at the end of G high? How am I gonna find that? Well, if we have constant growth thereafter of 
then the value at the end of year three would be based upon what? The dividend in year four divided by R minus G. And that's dividend three times one plus the constant growth. So I would take 3.91, my dividend in year three, times 1.03, 3.91 times 1.03, I get 4.02. Cost of common equity, 11 minus my constant growth, 3%. 4.02 divided by 8%. 50.29, $50.29. Now, how would we solve for intrinsic value? We don't want to do individual fractions that take too long. Cash flow one is your first dividend, 250. Cash flow two would be your second dividend, 3.125. Cash flow three would now be the sum of dividend three, 3.91 plus the terminal value at the end of year three, 50.29. So 50.29 plus the 3.91, 54.2. So enter 250, 3.125, 54.20, discount it all back at 11%. What is? the sum of the present value of all these future cash flows. The intrinsic value of anything is the sum of the present value of the future cash flows. So using a dividend discount model, let's take our 250 plus the 3.250, the 3.125, the 5420, Let's discount it all back at 11% and let's solve for the sum of the present value of those future cash flows. I got approximately $44.42. That would be the value. $44.42. Agreed? Sam, any questions about that? Does that help that person and everyone clear that up a little bit? Well, I think so. There were a couple of follow-ons. Uh, one, and I'm not sure if it was from this one or from a prior, but the first one, why do we not do residual income in year five and discount that back four periods? No, because what we're doing is the residual income in year four, if it's constant growth, is to get us the terminal value of the residual income. Okay, the terminal value, just like the terminal value at the end of year three is based upon the dividend in year four, Residual income in year four is to find the terminal value. Now, look, we could do this. If this person likes, maybe this will clear it up. You ready? Check this out. For the problem we just did, okay, for this problem, if you want to use fractions, the sum of the present value, the future cash flows, you ready? Take residual income one, $1.33. Discount that back. What was our discount rate here? 10.2%. 1.102, discount that back one year. Take residual income to 146, discount that back 1.102 for two years. Then you're going to take two numbers, residual income three, 161, discount that back three years. And then we're going to take the terminal value of the residual income, 2.07, discount that back also three years or simply add both of those together and discount the sum of the two 368 back three years but the value at the end of year three is dictated just like any company's values based upon what future cash flow so the residual income in year four drives the resi the terminal value at the end of year three is dictated by by the residual income in the following year Okay, so just like with the dividend discount model, if you want in a dividend discount model, if you want the terminal value of the company at the end of year five, then I need the dividend in what year? Six divided by R minus G. Then tell me cash flow one, two, three, four, and then cash flow five will be dividend five plus the terminal value at the end of year five, discounted back at whatever rate. All right. Sam, did that help? I think it did. There's one other question also. Uh, why don't we use R minus G in the denominator 
for residual income with persistence terminal value? No, because that R minus G, so remember the terminal value, which I'm going to solve for now, the terminal value, there's different ways. Like at the end of, let's say at the end of year three, we're going to have constant growth of 3% forever. Then what we would do is to get the terminal value at the end of year three, I would want the residual income in, in year four divided by R minus G, constant growth into perpetuity. But and that's method one of four. Or they might tell you, hey, you know what? You're not going to have constant growth forever. No. Instead, return on equity is going to converge towards your co cost of common equity, but it's going to take time. They're going to use a persistence factor. How long can I keep out the competition to keep my return on equity greater than my cost of common equity? They give you the persistence factor. Then the terminal value, residual income, would still be residual income year four, but one plus the cost of the common equity minus that persistence factor. That's method two of four. Method three of four, they might tell you at the end of year three, return on equity is immediately going to drop to your cost of common equity. Okay. Your return on equity is immediately going to fall to your cost of common equity. So your residual income thereafter, your residual income after year three, the terminal value, zero. If at the end of year three, return on equity is going to immediately equal your cost of common equity, then the terminal value of your residual income at that point in time is zero. Let me switch slides. I think this will be helpful, guys. So let me show you a little bit what our notes look like. Okay. Any questions, Sam? So far, no. All right. So watch this, folks. Four methods. All right. This comes from now. Now, we do two things at UWorld. What we just started with tonight is kind of step two in the process where we actually do application of rules that would have been taught in our pre recorded lecture. I'm now going back to step one and I'm going to show you. As a matter of fact, let me go all the way back. This is where we start our residual income class. So what we did tonight is kind of a little bit more advanced. It's like, okay, you've been through the pre-recorded lecture, but this is now the slide pack where we presume no prior knowledge, okay, folks? So this is like actually going through and teaching you residual income from scratch. So let me do that. Let me go back here, Sam, with the time we have remaining and folks, this probably, I don't know, was a three hour recording, two hour recording. I'm gonna I'm going to kind of expedite this because we only have about 45 minutes left or so. But let me kind of show you how we would teach it from scratch, okay? So first of all, we would go through well, what the hell is the residual income model in the first place? Like, how do you get value? And I'd show you, hey, intrinsic value under the residual income model is your book value of common equity today plus the sum of the present value of all future residual income. And that's going to be the number we have to calculate. We're going to go through, okay, in the lecture, well, how do you calculate this thing called residual income? All righty. So residual income we teach you is not the same thing. Come on. Residual income is not the same thing as accounting net income. Accounting net income is what you calculate per gap or IFRS. This is what's on the income statement, okay? That is different from valuation using residual income. We are not doing accrual basis accounting to get net income per the income statement, okay? Net income is net of cost of debt capital, right? Interest expenses deducted when arriving at net income, but cost of equity is not deducted when calculating net income, right? So what we're gonna do is we wanna calculate economic value added residual income which is net income per the income statement minus a cost of equity capital can you get me something left over after you've deducted a cost of equity capital so residual income is known as economic value added or abnormal profit all right hopefully we could get a return on equity greater than our cost of common equity a positive alpha that's good news right that's good 
But sometimes your return on equity is less than your hurdle, a negative, well, that's bad news, self-evident, right? So now what we would do is we would go through, hey, your residual income, take your net income, per that income statement, subtract your beginning book value of common equity times your hurdle as a percentage. Okay, so that's one way to do it. All righty, so that's one way to do it. So you could use your net income per share, or you can use your earnings per share minus your beginning book value per share times your cost of common equity. You could do that as well. Okay, or you could do your return on equity minus your cost of common equity times your beginning book value of common equity, right? So there's a whole host of ways of doing this. So we would go through that. Okay, so net income, if you subtract an equity charge, then you're calculating residual income. And your equity charge is a function of what? Cost of equity minus that beginning book value of common equity. But remember, you could also use what's called the capital charge method. No PAT minus SWAC economic value added residual income same thing so you take your ebit times one minus your tax rate subtract from that your total capital times your weighted average cost of capital same result different format right we saw questions that did that tonight so we saw that okay and then what we do in our classes we say well how could something like this be tested how could something like this be tested you ready? So let's do it. They tell me the book value of my total assets is 90 million. Okay, so I got assets of 90 million. Two thirds of that came through equity. 67% came from equity. There it means 33% of my capital is from debt. So if I want to calculate weighted average cost of capital, right? So they tell me cost of equity 12, cost of debt is 5, EBIT is 18, tax rate 25%. EBIT, 18, okay, minus our interest expense, minus the I, the interest expense. What is my interest expense? Well, they tell me we had cost of debt capital of 5%, okay? So I want to calculate, well, what is my interest expense? Well, 33% of 90 million, I got $30 million of my capital from debt. That means I got the other 67% times the 90 million, 60 million from equity. 30 million times 5%, 1.5 million. There's my interest. That leaves me earnings before tax, 16.5. Multiply that by one minus the tax rate, 1.25, there's your net income. Net income, 12.375. So I could take my residual income, net income minus my beginning book value of common equity times my cost of common equity. So my net income, 12.375, the beginning value of my equity, 60 million, what was my hurdle? Cost of common equity, 12%. 60 times 12%, that gets me my hurdle in dollars, 7.2. 12.375 minus 7.2. What's my residual income? 5.175. Or I could do my WAC, right? We could do 33% of our capital times our after-tax cost of debt. 5% times one minus the tax rate, that gets me 1.25. 67% of my capital came from equity that has a cost of 12%. That has a weighted cost of 8%. My weighted average cost of capital works out to be 9.25. 9.25, so another way to get residual income Total capital, your NOPAT minus your total capital times your WAC. We should get 5.175. My EBIT, 
was how much? 18. Multiply that by one minus your tax rate. 18 times 75%. What is our notepad? My notepad works out to be, let's see, 13.5. That is net operating profit after tax. Pop that in, 13.5. Total capital, 90 million times my weighted average cost of capital, five. Uh, my weighted, excuse me, 9.25%. That was my weighted average cost of capital. So in dollars, what's my hurdle? 90 times 1.25. So in dollars, my capital charge, 8.325. So that's called your capital charge. In dollars, we had a hurdle of 8.325. Yet we were able to generate Net operating profit after tax of 13.5 minus the 8.325. What do we get? Same result, different format, residual income, 5.175, okay? So we go through that, we practice that. There's all the numbers, nice and pretty, okay? So then what we do in our class is after we solve questions like this, then what we do is we say, okay, let's stop. You practice questions on that, and then let's come back and let's look at another subtopic. Okay, so the next thing is per the LOS, notice our materials are tied directly to the learning outcome statement. Hey, can you describe, not calculate, but describe what is a residual income model? The beauty of the residual income model is most of today's value is going to be attributed to what? The beginning book value of common equity objective versus the sum of the present value of all the future residual income, which is very subjective. Okay, so we like this because a lot of this comes from information that we can see today. All righty. So we go through examples. Another one. Okay, select the data for alpha Z. All right. So we want to calculate the intrinsic value. So intrinsic value, as soon as you see you're doing the residual income model, book value per share today. What's our book value per share? Book value, notice it's on a per share basis. I got 100. All righty. Then I want the sum of the present value of all future residual income, and the sum of the two will be today's intrinsic value. All righty. Now, just as an FYI, they tell me my book value of common equity, my book value of common equity, notice I'm 100% equity financed. So co total capital equals your total equity. So my book value of common equity, 90 million, divided by my number of common shares outstanding, 900,000. Book value per share again, if it wasn't given, you can find it just like that. Okay, now my residual income. I'm gonna do things on a per share basis this time, okay? My EPS minus my book value per share at the beginning of the period times my cost of common equity. So we're just mixing it up a little bit, doing it based upon per share. So my book value per share is 100. What's my cost of equity capital? 12%. So at a minimum in dollars or yen, whatever it is, what kind of rate of return do we want? 12. But what was my actual net income? Or excuse me, my actual earnings per share. Okay, my actual earnings per share. Well, they tell me we had net income of 13.5, which works out to be earnings per share of 15. So I didn't have to solve for it. That's my earnings per share for the year, 15. So my residual income is three. Okay, now notice something they tell me. Net income is 13.5 and is expected to remain at that level forever. So folks, what does that mean? No growth, no growth in earnings, no growth. So now how am I gonna find the sum of the present value of residual income? Okay, how am I gonna find that today? This is what I'm looking for, the sum of the present value of the residual income today. Return on equity subscript one divided by R minus G. That's return residual income, Subscript one, and we have no growth. It's going to stay that way forever. 
okay? It's going to stay that way forever. It's never going to change. So, folks, there is no growth. Growth is zero. All righty. So, this means the sum of the present value of the residual income today is residual income subscript one. All we're left with is our cost of common equity. It's our perpetuity formula, just like you find the value of preferred stock where the dividend does not change. Constant growth, for, excuse me, no growth, zero growth. So I'm gonna take three divided by my cost of common equity, 0.12. What's the sum of the present value of all future residual income? 25. Take that 25, pop it in here. What's today's intrinsic value? 125. Okay, there's the intrinsic value, 125. Okay, no growth. So we have the value of a perpetuity immediately with a constant growth of zero. So the Gordon growth model applies today, all righty, except there is no growth. There is no growth. All righty, so that's that, alpha Z. Let's see, um, covered that. Okay, so if you have a no growth company, when you see no growth company on the exam, what are you thinking? Payout rate should be what? Approximately 100%. Growth rate should be what? Zero. All righty, so if it's a no growth company and you're using a dividend discount model, Earnings forecasted, if you want today's intrinsic value, it would be your EPS at the end of year one times your payout. That would get you dividend subscript one. Divide that by R minus G. Okay. Another way to get dividend subscript one, today's dividend times one plus growth. Same result, different format. Another way to get Dividend subscript one, the intrinsic value today using a dividend discount model is dependent upon the dividend at the end of year one. If there's no growth, folks, if there's no growth, then dividend subscript zero times one plus zero divided by R minus zero, that's just today's dividend divided by your cost of common equity. Okay, that's if you're doing a dividend discount model. Okay. So in our example, very similar, but we were doing a residual income model. With a residual income model, the beginning book value of common equity today, 100, plus the sum of all the present value of residual income, the sum of all the present value of residual income, residual income subscript one divided by cost of common equity. All righty. There is no growth. All right, so read carefully when there's no growth, okay, it's a perpetuity. You're valuing a perpetuity. You divide by your cost of common equity. You divide by your cost of common equity, okay? Now, um, let's see, total capital, we've covered all these concepts. All right, so this is the example I did earlier. I want to jump ahead. I want to do some other items here. Okay, these are adjustments. I, I don't have time to get into all these little nuances, but our course goes through every testable LOS, all the little nuances. Okay, I want to jump ahead now. And I want to show you all the different ways of calculating your residual income. So those four methods. So. I want to show you the four different ways we can calculate our residual income. So let's do it. All right. So here we go. You ready? Terminal value, residual income. So they might tell us return on equity abruptly falls to equal your cost of common equity. You know what that means? The terminal value of your residual income equals what? Zero. There's not going to be any more. That's it. So that's option number one. It could be that the terminal value of your residual income is zero. Okay. Another thing they could do to you remains constant at a positive level. So that would mean the terminal value of the residual income, let's say at the end of year four, 
would be residual income year five divided by R minus G. You would have to calculate residual income subscript five. And then the sum of the present value of residual income would be residual income one, two, three, four, with residual income four being residual income four plus the terminal value of residual income four, then you would enter your discount rate. And that's how you would get that piece of the puzzle because our intrinsic value, beginning book value of common equity today, plus the sum of the present value of residual income. All right, so I'm just making it up. Let's say it remains at a constant level. So years, I don't know, one through four, we have residual income, we have a return on equity of whatever, or a growth rate of whatever. Okay, but at the end of year four, we then have a particular constant growth. Okay, we could have number three gradually declines towards zero. It converges. They would give you a persistence factor like we've seen. A persistence factor. Or they simply tell you, hey, return on equity is going to revert to a some level other than R. Okay, they'll give you a certain level. Okay, or they could tell you the company's going to trade at a certain premium over book value at a certain point in time. And that's how you would calculate the terminal value of your residual income, okay, at whatever period of time. So let's do it. Let's practice some of these. So let's make sure you guys got it. Let's take a look at some facts now. So, and I'm going to make this 14%. I did all my solutions with a, a cost of common equity of 14%. Okay, so let's make that 14%. So we want intrinsic value using a residual income model. Book value of common equity subscript zero plus the sum of the present value residual income. And we're going to calculate that a variety of different ways. Right now, the book value of common equity is 18 plus what's the sum of the present value of residual income. Our goal is to figure out, hey, is the market price fair? Is it undervalued? Is it overvalued? Okay, initial return on equity is 20%. That is not sustainable into perpetuity. Not sustainable forever. Okay. They tell me years one through four, EPS is calculated using return on equity at the beginning of the year. A return on equity times the beginning book value. Okay, required rate of return of 14. Dividend payout rate 60%. Okay. If return on equity of 20% today, if that was sustainable, forever, then the sum of the present value of our residual income would be residual income one divided by R minus G, okay? And that growth would be constant into perpetuity if that 20% was sustainable forever, okay? If we had constant growth, okay? Or no growth, whatever they want to give you. Sometimes you could calculate right away depending upon the facts. But look at this example right here. You ready? Where would we get these missing numbers? Well, this is our beginning book value of common equity, subscript zero. They told me my return on equity was 20%. There's our EPS, 360. Okay, there's our EPS. Our dividend, they told us the dividend, the payout rate was 60%, 0.60. There's our dividend. Ending book value, add your return on equity, excuse me, add your earnings per share, subtract your dividend, there's your ending book value. How do we get our residual income? Earnings per share, 360. Earnings per share, 360. Minus our quote unquote equity charge. We started with 18. We were hoping for a return of 14%. That's 252, 360 minus 252, 
There's residual income subscript one. They just do it in a little bit of a different order. It doesn't matter. You're going to get the same result. I like the order in which I did it. It doesn't matter though. Okay, so you could see it in the text different ways. Return on equity, 20% times the beginning. There's your EPS subscript two. Multiply that by your payout rate, 60%. There's your dividend. Add your earnings per share, subtract your dividend. There's your book value to the next year. Our equity charge, now it's 14% times 1944. We had EPS of 389, 389 minus the equity charge of 272. That's how they got the residual income subscript two of $1.17. 21 times the 20%, 420, there's your earnings. Multiply that by your payout, there's your dividend, there's your ending book value per share. Equity charge, 14% times the 21. Then we have earnings per share that year to get our residual income subscript three, that was the 420 minus the 294. This 420 minus the 294. Then lastly, the fourth year times 20%, there's your earnings times 60%, there's your dividend, 2450 is your ending book value, our equity charge, 14% of 2268. We had earnings per share of 454 minus the equity charge, residual income subscript four. Okay, now the question becomes, what's the terminal value at the end of year four? That is the key now. What is going to be the terminal value now that we've calculated residual income one, two, three, four? What's going to be the terminal value for residual income thereafter? Okay, so that return on equity of 20%, return on equity of 20% was only for four years. It was not sustainable into perpetuity. Okay, it was not sustainable. All right, so that terminal value, let's look at different assumptions now. Alrighty, so here's one of four. Assuming return on equity decreases to 14% after year four. So now your return on equity, 14, is gonna equal your cost to common equity, 14. Thus, terminal value, residual income at the end of year four is what? Zero, zero. So now enter, I don't like the fractions because it takes too long, but this is the sum of the present value of all future residual income. I would enter residual income one, 108. Residual income two, 117. Residual income three, 1.26. And then residual income four plus the terminal value residual income year four. Residual income for 136 plus zero, 136. Discount that all back at 14%. Sum of the present value of all your future residual income, 350. Intrinsic value, book value of common equity today, 18 plus the sum of the present value of all future residual income, 350, 2150. But at the end of year four, Terminal value of residual income at the end of year four is zero because their return on equity just, just immediately drops to cost of common equity. No more value added thereafter. So that's one of four ways we can deal with the terminal value of the residual income. Okay, that's one way to deal with the terminal value of the residual income at the end of year four. Let's look at another approach, another way they could test this exam day. You ready? So this will be method two of four. They tell us method two of four. Sorry about that, folks. Method two of four, terminal value of residual income at the end of year four. It says, what if residual income stays constant indefinitely? Okay, so that means the terminal value of the residual income at the end of year four is then equal to the residual income Year five divided by R minus G, but there's no growth. No growth. It doesn't change. It stays the same forever. 
So that means residual income five is going to equal residual income four. It's not going to change. It's going to stay the same. There's no growth. Okay, there's no growth. So terminal value, residual income four would be equal to 136. Residual income year four was 136 times one plus zero divided by cost of common equity minus zero. So that works out to be 971. Terminal value, residual income, 971. So the way I would do it, I wouldn't do the fractions. It takes too long. So enter residual income one, cash flow one, 108. Residual income two, 1.17. Residual income three, 1.26. And then enter residual income four, 136, plus the terminal value of the residual income. 971, enter that as 1107, discount that all back at 14%, and the sum of the present value of all future residual income, approximately 925. Intrinsic value, today's book value, plus the sum of the present value of all future residual income. Today's book value, 18, plus the 925, 2725. So that's another assumption. OK. Another way they could do it. With that persistence factor, we don't want return on equity equity to abruptly drop. That's not realistic. OK, so that is generally not. Realistic. So what do we have instead? A persistence factor where the terminal value of the residual income in year four will be residual income subscript five times one plus the cost of common equity minus a persistence factor. That could be anywhere from zero to one. As the persistence factor goes up, the terminal value of that residual income goes up, the intrinsic value goes up with it, okay? So let's see what that would look like. Oh, and by the way, again, here's all the little details. We leave nothing out. Why would you have a higher persistence factor closer to one, which is good news? Market leadership, historically been able to maintain it, lower payout. When do you have lower persistence, getting closer to zero? You have very high rates of accrual-based earnings versus cash-based. Remember, accrual basis earnings are less persistent that has overlap with financial statement analysis. Okay, persistence of earnings is more likely when you have more cash base than accrual base. You have more non-recurring items. You have a lot of accruals. Okay, so let, let me show you what this is. All right, so don't even look at that. How would you now look at, you ready? Given, let's say you're given this information. Now you're given a persistence factor of 70%. Okay, and let's say you're given, um, let's see, uh, your book value of common equity, end of year four, which is the beginning of year five, book value of common equity, end of year four, which is the same thing, book value of common equity, beginning of year five. They could give you this, or we actually carried this over from the problem we just did. Let's say your return on equity in year five, let's say that would have to be given. They would have to tell you what your return on equity is in year five. Let's say it's 20%. EPS year five, 490. Okay, 490. All righty. Cost of common equity, 14%. So let's take that 2450 times our cost of common equity, 14%. That gets us a desired hurdle of 343 in dollars. So we have residual income year five, 147. So the way we would find our terminal value, residual income, end of year four. Terminal value, residual income, end of year four, residual income five plus one plus your cost, divided by one plus your cost of common equity, minus your persistence factor. So that would be 1.47 divided by 1.14 minus a 
Terminal value, 334. All righty, so then you would enter residual income one, 108, then 1.17, then 1.26, then 1.36, residual income four, plus the terminal value, 3.34. You would get 4.7, enter one, two, three, four, discount it all at 14%. The sum of the present value of your future residual income, 548. 18 plus 548, the sum of the present value of all future residual income, 2348. Okay, so that's another way using a persistence factor. Okay, that's another way to get the terminal value of your residual income. An alternative approach, they tell you and I'm going to make this 2450, 2450. Okay, another way, the stock is going to trade at a 50% premium. Whatever the book value per share is at the end of year four, multiply that by 1.5, and there's the market value. All righty, so we had 2450 times a dollar uh, times 1.5. Okay, 2450 times 1.5. We got 2450 times 1.5. We have a market value, therefore, of 36.75 minus that book value of 2450. Well, that gets us the terminal value of residual income at the end of year four. That gets us 1225. 1225. Again, I would not do the fractions. Nothing wrong with it. Takes too long. Enter residual income one, 108, then two, then three, and then residual income cash flow four would be the sum of a dollar thirty-six plus the twelve twenty-five. Thirteen sixty-one. Thirteen sixty-one. So notice one, two, and three is the same. What's changing is how we're estimating the terminal value of the residual income. That's the piece of the puzzle that's changed. Discount it all back at 14%. What do we think the sum of the present value of the residual income is? We think that is 1075. So the value would be intrinsic value, book value today, 18 plus the sum of the present value of the residual income, 1075, 2875. Again, the fractions are not incorrect, but it takes too long to individually discount each and every future cash flow. When you have the exact same discount rate, it's a hell of a lot easier to just enter your future cash flows. All right, so we have lots of ways that we can estimate the terminal value of that residual income, okay? So, uh, you know, the other thing we go through, you know, what are the strengths? What are the weaknesses of residual income? These are all the things that are testable uh, per the LOSs. All right, let me open it up to questions, questions. Anyone who joined us late, when is it appropriate, least appropriate, et cetera? Anybody who joined us late, who are we? You world finance, baby. If you're taking a high stakes exam that's going to change the rest of your life you're taking the mcat the usmle medical licensing you want to be a nurse you want to be a doctor you want to be a lawyer studying for the bar you're studying for the cpa or you're studying for the cfa or cma you're in the right place this is what we do we specialize in high stakes test prep it's a combination of walking you through now again i went through this in an abbreviated fashion but this is like three, four, five hours worth of lecture. I wanted to illustrate, well, part of what we do, what I started with tonight was problem solving. That's kind of step two in the process. Step number one is, hey, walking you through the lecture, the notes, all right? And then that's the pre-recorded lecture. Then we have what's called live online Saturday classes. Now, the folks, the live online Saturday classes, just so you guys know, we work end of chapter questions in the CFA Institute book, but the hardest ones. And many times the detailed explanatory answer in the book, if you've been studying, is lacking. You know, sometimes they don't explain why the wrong answers are wrong, or they don't really explain step by step how to get the correct answer. All right, so we use a lot of those end of chapter questions and or our own problems to illustrate application of the rules. Then at the end of the course, this Saturday, Sunday, as a matter of fact, we're doing a boot camp, a two day, 
and it's all day, but they're heavily tested, not the minutia. Okay, we're talking about, you know, the pension accounting, the multinational uh, operations, uh, you know, the consolidations, the derivatives, the equity, the fixed income, you know, the, the portfolio management, heavily tested math intensive, where we can really help you now in saying, okay, here's good strategy once you know the rules and how to apply that to these vignettes. All right, and that's what we're doing this weekend, Saturday, Sunday, if you want to join us. So anybody who wants to join us, we got QR codes for you. So hopefully you can see my screen there. All righty, so if you are interested in signing up with us, okay, for any of the uh, packages we have, okay, you can use those QR codes. And uh, I don't know, I think this one is the same one. Yeah, I think that's just a duplicate. But let me get both up there. And Sam, am I leaving anything out? No, you covered it. Uh, some people have been asking about when we, uh, when will this recording uh, this session be available? Uh, so it will be available uh, in a few days. Uh, they have to Four process to it a little bit, but uh, it will be available early next week. We have your emails, so uh, you'll be able to. Uh, we'll communicate with you and just let you know it's available. Send you a link and you'll be able to watch this. Yeah, and then folks, again, like I said, this Saturday, Sunday, Sam, are we selling that separate? If anybody wants to just come to the boot camp this weekend, is that available for sale separate from the whole course, given that uh, if somebody's sitting I right away? I believe that it is. Uh, and the best, way to, the best way to do that is just go to um, uh, finance.uworld.com and uh, there should have information on how to access that uh, at that location. Got it, got it. So if you guys are looking forward to join me uh, this weekend, I will not let you down, folks. So we are going to be covering, covering heavy hitting topics, more math intensive, forward futures, options, swaps. Uh, like I said, the equities, debt, portfolio management. Um, yeah, so some of the uh, 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 quant, et cetera, but the heavy hitting topics, Saturday, Sunday, you're welcome to join us. It mirrors the exam day, so I try to keep it just like your exam day is going to be. So, you know, between your break and everything, it's about five hours you're there. So I go from nine to two with just like two 15-minute breaks because I want to build up that mental endurance. So, yes, it's a boot camp. It's like joining the Marines with me. I am your sergeant. So, uh, yeah, nine to two on Saturday or three, give or take. Sometimes I go late. Same thing on Sunday, nine to two or three. But no nonsense, no big, long lunch breaks. It's just like exam day to build up the mental endurance. I won't let you down if you join, okay? And if you guys want to share this with your colleagues, the QR codes, you're welcome to do so. And uh, that's all I got. So if you got no other questions for me, thank you so much for attending. I know this was free financially, but it was certainly not free in terms of your time. And we do appreciate your time. I hope you got out a lot, a lot out of this, and I'm hoping we earn your business. Thank you. I echo that, Pete. Thank you so much, Pete, for your time. We've got a lot of good feedback on you tonight. Uh, I think everyone appreciated this. It was certainly very helpful. And uh, also, I a few people have been asking about the boot camp. And what I would recommend they do is reach out to our customer care because there, maybe some of that information is actually not on the website, or if it is, it's it's not easily findable. So. Uh, just, you know, send an email over to our customer care area and they will certainly be able to assist. Sam, so do you again, want to give them, should I give them my email or you, your email? We could forward it to customer service so that there's, no, you know, a simple email. Is there somebody, a point person, you know their email right now? I'll write it down for the folks. Unfortunately, no. Um, I, it's really just in, uh, hold on, I'm looking this up now. Well, actually, there is an area called Contact Us on the U World e website. And well, we need that's somebody to get back to them immediately. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to give yeah. them Madeline's email just to make sure there's no screw ups. This way, if somebody wants to join us, time is of the essence. And I don't want someone thinking they can get back to a student next week because they'll need to get back to them like now. So if you don't mind, I'll give them Madeline's email and then let her know to forward that to the right person to get them uh, enrolled. Is that okay? That's fine. All right. So let me do that. So here, my buddy Madeline. So let her know 
Madeline is, uh, let's see, her email, M Madeline C H E E Z U M at, I can't do an at sign, at uworld.com. So her name is Madeline. We call her Mad for short, but she's always happy. Madeline Cheesum. M Cheesum at uworld.com. If you're interested Saturday, Sunday, show make sure you get enrolled ASAP so I can see you bright and early Saturday, 9 a.m. Eastern. I would also think uh, if you could add uh, maybe Chad Wadley's email on that okay. as well. Or another one, Mr. Chad. So C W A, send it to both of them. And this way you double your chances of somebody getting back to you immediately. So at uworld.com. So that's C-W-A-D-L-E-Y at uworld.com. Um, and tell them you're interested in the discount as well. But you'll be able to join me for Saturday, Sunday. And I would love to see you there. All right, folks. Thank you again so much for your time. And uh, we really do appreciate you taking a look at UWorld and um, hope to see you at uh, future engagements. You got it, guys. Good luck studying. See you soon. Thank you, Sam. Thank you. Thanks, Pete. Have a good Bye. night, everybody.